we are looking at modern theories or theories developed after the HOS model. And now let us look at the last theory in this section. And this explains trade between developed or industrialized countries. If we break down the world trade by countries, what we find is the bulk of world trade is in manufactures and this takes place between similarly placed countries, particularly industrialized countries. And most of this world trade is in the same industry group or a country exports and imports within the same industry group. For example, the US will export cars and also import cars. This kind of trade is referred to as intra-industry trade and this is a significant proportion of total trade for developed or industrialized countries and as developing countries develop over time for example BRICS this proportion of intra-industry trade also increases for them so let us examine intra-industry trade and as a first step we'll once again revisit the definition of intra-industry trade and how we measure it. To measure intra-industry trade, we use the symbol T. And there's a formula to measure intra-industry trade and this is given as one minus the absolute value of Xi minus Mi divided by Xi plus Mi, where Xi represents the export of the ith industry and MI represents the import of the IETH industry. <clears throat> and this IETH industry could be cars, it could be airplanes, it could be anything. So, so when we are looking at perfect intra-industry trade, that means the exports of the IETH industry must equal the imports of the IETH industry, or this numerator will collapse to zero. In such a case, the value of T will be one. So when we have perfect intra-industry trade, T equals one. And suppose this country exports the IETH product, but does not import it. So imports of the IETH product becomes zero. In such a case, what we will have is this T will become zero. And T is zero when we have the case of perfect industry, inter-industry trade. And what is inter-industry trade? Once again, you trade across industry, you export clothing, and you import food to different industries. So higher the value of T, greater is the extent of intra-industry trade. To understand intra-industry trade, what we need to understand are characteristics of developed or industrialized countries. The first thing we should note is people in general want to choose from a wide variety of similar products or there is a demand for differentiated products. These are similar but not exactly the same. For example, how many varieties of potato chips are available in the US? It's probably 100 or 200. I do not know, but it's a large variety of potato chips. Similarly for cars, similarly for clothing, and so on. So people want to have the ability to choose from a wide variety of similar products. And in the rich countries, these people can afford it. Number two we should know is, in developed countries, what we have are imperfect market condition. And this is very different from perfect competition that we had assumed under HOS. And we'll examine this in the subsequent slide. The third thing we know about people is they want to pay the lowest possible price or they'll demand more when the price is lower and less when the price is higher. So these are the key characteristics of developed countries. Now, different sectors in industrialized countries are characterized by less than perfect competition or what is imperfect competition. And imperfect competition or less than perfect competition 
can give rise to a variety of conditions. Let us look at monopoly. Monopoly refers to a situation in which you have one seller and there is no other seller in the world which can produce exactly what the monopolist is producing, monopoly. <clears throat> then we have what is called monopolistic competition. This is an in-between situation between monopoly and perfect competition. So here, what we have is number of sellers, which is greater than one, but less than what we have under perfect competition. And so it has some elements of monopoly and some elements of competition. And under monopolistic competition, we can study when consumers have demand for differentiated products. So we can use this model to study demand for differentiated product. Now, under monopolistic competition, what we assume is there is no interdependence in terms of decision making. And, and that we model, that is interdependence in decision making, we model under oligopoly. And this is a situation in which you have greater than one seller, but they are very few, so you can count them on your fingers. For example, you look at soft drinks, Pepsi versus Coke, or you look at large commercial aircrafts, Boeing versus Airbus. So in those kind of markets, you have greater interdependence, and those require special class of models. And those special class of models are based on very specific assumptions. So for each situation, we'll get a different model and different results. So it's very hard to teach all that trade that takes place under oligopoly. So we'll not do that. We'll focus on monopolistic competition, which is much easier to handle. So once again, remember monopolistic competition has some elements of monopoly and some elements of competition. So this is one part, how the market is characterized. The second thing you should know is we have discussed economies of scale. That is, the more we produce, the lower becomes the average cost of production. And this is also a characteristic of different sectors in the industrialized world. Now let us look at specific assumptions of monopolistic competition. The first one is a standard one, that is we assume economic agents are rational and have perfect knowledge. The second assumption is that the number of sellers is less than what we would have under perfect competition and greater than one. The third one is interesting, and that is products produced by different sellers are imperfect substitutes. That is, these are similar products but not exactly the same. And this is true from the perspective of the consumers. For example, if you look at toothpaste, there are different companies that produce toothpaste. It could be Colgate, it could be Crest, it could be Mentodent. So these are toothpaste, but then in the eyes of the consumer or from the perspective of the consumer, Crest might be different from Colgate. And this is what the companies try to do. They spend a lot of money on advertising and packaging. And what they are trying to do is create brand loyalty. And so it might it is up to the consumer who might feel that Crest will whiten your teeth more than Colgate or Mentodent. And consumers of Colgate may think just the opposite. So so firms under monopolistic competition spend, the one is they create differentiated products. So they have some kind of a monopoly power over the consumers. So once you have created brand loyalty, now you have some kind of a monopoly power over those consumers. Another thing we should note is the following. Under monopolistic competition, we assume free entry, free exit. That means it is costless for anyone to start business or anyone to quit business. And this simply means there's always a threat of survival for these firms because their competitors are producing similar products. So these firms 
are under pressure to come up with new and new products and at the same time come up with cost cutting innovations so they can always keep a competitive price if they don't their survival is threatened so this is the kind of market structure we have in developed countries monopolistic competition another thing we know is that production in these countries is subject to economies of scale and a quick recap of this concept economies are internal to a firm so we could also call them internal economies of scale this is also called increasing returns to scale or irs and what this means is if a firm doubles all its inputs output will more than double or in other words as we produce more and more factor productivity increases as a firm produces more and more and in the last or the previous lecture video we have learned that long run average cost will decline as factor productivity increases and how does factor productivity increase it increases when the firm produces more and more output so these are the concepts which characterize what we have in developed countries and in the next lecture video what we'll do is we'll look at a model which explains intra industry trade using monopolistic competition and also economies of scale thank you for your time